Thank you very much for staying on. Welcome back. Let's now settle over the very first story. The chief executive of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, UV Grant, has mounted a strong defense against claims that figures released by it as FDIs are inaccurate. He's therefore called on auditors, researchers, and investors to seek relevant information at the appropriate data collection offices of the GIPC. UV Grant has been speaking to Joy Business. It's unfortunate that, first of all, that situation should not care. Um, that, um, you know, uh, a presumably high ranking officer of the government should say that our figures reflect only intentions and not reality. Because there is ample in, uh, there's ample evidence of foreign direct investment in Ghana, I mean, in the banking sector, in the hospitality sector, in the mining sector, even in agriculture. And of course, I mean, those, those investments come in. That's how come all those institutions are built. And so, I mean, for anybody to say that um, the numbers we bring are only intentions is pretty unfortunate because it's not real, it's not true. Um, the, 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 the harder part is that then you have to prove all those numbers and figures. And we do have a, a system of reconciling or collecting the uh, foreign direct investments that come in. Um, the truth of the matter is that many institutions collect different information. Some may collect cash. For the GIPC is, is both cash and equipment, etc., that go as part of FDI. We've had our figures looked at by various international agencies who validated. We've used these same, we've used the same methodology for many years. It's not something we started to do now, and um, and so the truth of the matter is, if you look at our economy, it's not because GIPC is saying it. We know the impact of foreign direct investment. We know the investments that have come in. We know what they've created, the business that we create. Ours is to look for more investments to come in and build a, better, a bigger and better nation. Because I keep saying, the more foreign direct investment we have, the more businesses we can create. The more businesses we can create, the more jobs we can create. And, uh, and so that's what it is. Um, and for us, the key, the key situation right now is moving forward how to engage foreign direct investments with local partnerships. Um, because, like I said, um, it's a relationship. So the more we can get local partnerships for foreign direct investment, the more it will elevate the status of the Ghanaian itself. Let's turn attention to revenue matters now. And the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA, is working on mechanisms to identify online businesses to pay taxes as part of its revenue generation drive. Chief Revenue Officer Kwesi Ewukulabi says new trends of business via the internet makes targeting relevant. Nana Yajima was at the sensitization workshop for players in the creative arts industry in Kumasi where he filed his report. Even though GRA has been working on a scheme for taxing online businesses for years, it is yet to achieve the desired results. Creative arts industry players, for instance, have resorted to internet-based outlets like YouTube to generate income. Tax officials say there are other modern internet-based businesses they are unable to track. Kwesi Aukulabi is chief revenue officer. I can tell you right now, GRA is embarking on e-commerce projects, okay, to identify transactions that are online. I know the project is going on. And in our strategic, uh, strategic plan for 2015 to 2017, okay, it was part of the initiative to determine uh, ways of taxing, uh, to develop a mechanism for taxing the e-commerce. So it's gradually developing, and with time, I won't say that we are total, totally done. We have totally developed that, those structures, but it's the process. Government has commenced processes to draw the creative arts sector into a proper tax regime. Mr. Aukulabi believes understanding the tax system is a major step in ensuring success of the project. Now starting sensitizing them, uh, letting them file their returns, we are trying also to know maybe the number of people engaged. You know, we have to base everything on scientific discoveries. If you don't know, how can you project? How can you estimate? Okay, now on the Shufa, they know that we have 100 people in Kumasi, we have these people here, and they are earning so much here. They can say, all right, let's make a, an estimate or target of so much. The Creative Arts Council is encouraging members to explore online platforms as a means of commercializing their works. Mark Okwekumante is president. We can get one common platform. Done. That will be like a management company. 
that will aggregate all of us. That is doable. It is, it is a, an individual mindset because copyright is to do with an individual rights. And so we can only sensitize and educate as we go. But there's nothing we can do as a group to force it on you. It is, it is just orienting you to buy into the concept. Nana Ojima reporting. Meanwhile, the Ghana Revenue Authority has debunked concerns that the new GIA prosecution policy will be used to harass existing taxpayers. Commissioner General Emmanuel Kufinti says the policy document seeks to facilitate effective prosecution of tax offenders from improved revenue mobilization. The draft legislation is made, meant to improve compliance and increase revenue through re revenue mobilization in a transparent, fair, effective, and efficient manner. These are concerns of incidents of uh, there are concerns of incidents of unnecessary prosecution of every non-compliance case. Prince Apia also has more in this report. Ghana Revenue Authority often struggle to achieve the annual target because of high rate of tax non-compliance. The draft legislation is meant to improve compliance and increase revenue mobilization in a transparent, fair, effective and efficient manner. Commissioner General Emmanuel Kofiti provides details. One important tool made available by the various laws to elicit compliance is the prosecution of tax offenses. We, however, believe that the powers to prosecute must be guided by a documented policy made, made known to the public to ensure consistency in application and the development of this policy. Last year, I made it clear that the era of business as usual at GRA is gone forever. And that going forward, GRA is going to bite hard. This is because GRA's intention is to increase the use of prosecutions as one of its weapons in the fight against non-compliance, tax evasion, tax and customs fraud. All GRA officers who are expressly mandated to enforce tax laws the will apply the policy if it is approved. Mr. Inti says the policy document will be made public for enhanced public understanding. He says the policy will not be used to harass existing taxpayers. The GRA will not use the launch and implementation of this prosecution policy policy to harass existing and potential taxpayers on the least pretext not to settle scores. Rather, prosecution will be used to complement administrative actions contained in the task force for non-compliance to ensure that there is a constant and regular flow of revenue to the national coffers. GRA is not interested in collapsing any business. GRA is interested in all the business surviving for the long term so that the state can have its fair share of revenue. Meanwhile, Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osemensa warns GRA against what he describes as unnecessary prosecution of every non-compliance case. I also want to use this platform to advise the Ghana Revenue Authority to do its homework diligently and gather enough evidence on defaulters before proceeding to court to ensure successful prosecutions. Such positive prosecutions will inspire confidence in the system. GRA Legal Affairs and Treaties Department collaborated with British Department for International Development to put the document together. Prince Apia, reporting. This is live on the marketplace. Let's now turn attention to one of our top stories. And the minority in Parliament is kicking against an attempt by government to amend a petroleum agreement with AGM Petroleum, which they warn will reduce Ghana's stake in the South Deepwater Tunnel contract area from 48% to 18%. The proposed amendment was laid in Parliament on Monday and is expected to be approved before the House goes on break tomorrow. Former Petroleum Minister Kofi Bua says the block will eventually go to Aka Energy and the move is to create a convenient environment for them. My colleague Joseph Opoku Gakpo is in Parliament. He joins us live with some more updates. Uh, Joseph, you welcome to the marketplace. <laughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. All right, so what exactly are the concerns of the minority with regards to this contract area that you're referring to? 
Uh, and so they're raising a number of them. So that document in question, seeking to uh, amend the agreement between government and um, the other firm in relation to the South Deep Water Tunnel contract area, that's um, AGM Petroleum, the minority says it will not be in the interest of the country. And they point to a number of things. They, for example, claim that when the said suggested amendment comes into force, the interest of Ghana in that particular block will reduce from 43% all the way to 18%. And they break that down and claim that the GNPC subsidiary, a firm called Exploco, which ordinarily would have had about 24% stake in that particular block, would have 0% per the review of the agreement that's to be done. And additionally, um, the state would have its interest reduced in that particular block from 23% to 18%. And it's an average of that that is leading to a reduction of the total stake they claim from 43 all the way to 18%. And the minority, led by Emmanuel Amakofibwa, who is the former Minister for Petroleum, says they think this will shut in the country. They, the minority, will not support the agreement. He indicates that this agreement that was signed in the NDC administration, and it had all the necessary right terms. So they are at a loss as to how come government is seeking to actually get this particular agreement renegotiated. In fact, they are pointing to another document and claim that there was an earlier attempt to renegotiate this particular deal when um, uh, Boachier Jacon was uh, minister for energy, which Mr. Boachier Jacon objected to and did not allow for the renegotiation. So there's a minority at a loss as to how come uh, Peter Mbewu is hoping to get it renegotiated. We are expecting Mr. Mbewu here in Parliament a little later in the day to meet the Committee on Mines and Energy because the committee is expected to submit a report to the floor today or latest by tomorrow for the said suggested amendment to be approved. Um, and so Mr. Mo will be meeting the committee after the committee will present its report to the floor generally uh, later today or tomorrow morning. Now, Joseph, they have also mentioned, you know, the Ake, you know, Ake oil, uh, oil, uh, energy, oil, oil energy as uh, trying to link up with this contract area. Why Ake? Because this is another area out of Ake's jurisdiction. Why is he mentioning Ake in contact with this uh, area? Uh, so they, 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 they are pointing to the document that came to Parliament from John Peter Mau, the Energy Minister, and Ken Oforiata, the Finance Minister. And this is an amendment to the agreement which involves the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation and GNPC. But let me quote to you where the company Aka Energy comes into play. Um, j j j just to read this portion, it says, Patricia Holding AS acquired all issued shares in the parent company of AGM. And this transfer occurred about the same time that Aka Energy, which is a subsidiary of Patricia, also took over adjacent deep water tunnel keep three points from Hairs Ghana Limited. And so that's where they're drawing the linkage with Aka Energy, that there's a situation where um, the parent company, which holds Aka Energy, Patricia, uh, is actually the same company that's gone into an agreement with the said firm, AGM Petroleum, which is the holder of this particular stake. And uh, according to Kofi Amaboa, he sees a situation where there's a deliberate attempt to create a conducive atmosphere for Aka Energy to benefit a lot more as far as this latest deal is concerned. And they, the minority, say they will object it with all the energy they can put together. Many thanks for that update. Joseph Opoku Gakpo reaching us from Parliament and uh, updating us on Parliament minorities, minority in Parliament decision to kick against attempts by government to amend a petroleum agreement with AG and Petroleum, which they say will shortchange the country. Turning away from that, Unilever Ghana has underscored the importance of having the most skilled workforce in a globally competitive manufacturing space. The company believes business efficiency and growth are dependent on highly skilled labor in modern technology and products. The company has spent some 13 million pounds sterling in the last 36 months on maintaining the factory to enhance growth. Supply chain director at Unilever Ghana, Nazaire Jaco, disclosed this at the Tema factory after commissioning a learning center with U jointly with UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt, the small industry report. Having operated in Ghana since the 1960s, Unilever has churned out different household retail products to serve the needs of consumers. 
After decades of operation, the company continues to play special emphasis on skilled labor in order to remain competitive. It is in this direction that a learning center which can host 116 persons at full capacity has been refurbished. According to Nazir Jaco, the learning center is expected to teach staff new trends in the manufacturing world. So we need people for productivity, we need people for competitiveness, we need people everywhere. But the most important one, you can have the people that if they are not well skilled, you may not be competitive. So the learning center does the purpose, developing our people's skills, upgrade them and give them the possibility for them to learn everything they can learn because there will be various kind of books in the libraries there also be computers and so on and so forth from research to all the way out we make soaps and so on and the technology is and so on and so forth so people have to learn and that is where we, we, we are looking at uh, what are we looking at making sure that people develop themselves meanwhile nazir jaco says the company has invested in solar energy as additional source to the national grid i think solar panel is something which is now worldwide because we want to make sustainable uh, everything we are using to produce our goods so we have solar here in ghana in africa in west africa i think it's great to use it we are not going to run away you still need a grid to make sure that you still have consistent supply of power. So we always remain connected to the grid. When it comes to solar, we'll always support people to go solar immediately in Africa because there's a need for that. Okay, we don't have a battery, we don't have everything like this. So it's a day use. In the evening, you will make sure that you use the grid. Visiting UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt lauded Unilever in the use of advanced technology in production. He says the UK will support the company in its bid to increase its production to serve the West African markets. Now, the Bank of Ghana has announced for the information of the general public the fees, charges and costs of banking products and services here in Ghana. The bank's latest report highlights in detail form what individuals and corporate entities must pay on certain products and services the banks offer. Joy of Business's Philip Namfuri has been going through the report and has joined me in the studio with more highlights. Philip, what's the essence of this report in the first place? Well, uh, Emmanuel, it's essentially to update the general public on the various products and services that the banks offer and how much they are charging on the different offers. And it was put together by the Financial Stability Department of the Bank of Ghana. It covers 23 banks, and I suspect it's going to be a quarterly report. Because if you're going through the report, it says as of March 1st, March 31st, 2019. So I suspect that every quarter we should be seeing this. But it's just to update you and I on the various charges uh, in a more aggregated manner. Or, uh, as we conduct businesses with the banks. Mm. Any highlights on the initial you know, um, re operating requirements of these banks? Okay, so interesting stuff, uh, stuff here. First one, initial deposit required uh, for a savings account. Uh, it differs, it, it ranges between zero and 100 Ghana cities. So you realize that uh, initial deposit re uh, required is what you need to open an account. And if you look at it, you see that there are some banks that are charging as much as 100 Ghana cities on your left-hand side and as little as zero on your right-hand side. So if you are going to open a bank account, savings account to be specific, mm. you should be prepared to pay between the range of nothing and 100 Ghana cities. So that's for the initial deposit for a savings account. For individuals? Yes, for well individuals. companies? No. Mm. Companies do not operate savings accounts. They will have okay. to operate current, current accounts. Mm. Yeah, very good. Mm. So if you look at this, there's another thing also, minimum operating balance. Okay. What you must have in the bank account, regardless of uh, how much you're taking out. Yeah. So if you look at it, you realize that it's between zero and 100. What it simply means is that if you have this amount in your bank, so let's say you have 50 as your minimum operating balance like one of the banks has, and you deposit 200 Ghana and you're going to withdraw, you can't withdraw below that 50 Ghana CDs within the account. So that's the minimum operating mm -hmm. balance. The initial deposit is for when you're opening the account, okay. and minimum is for when the account has been opened, what you must maintain in it. So, for, so you can't withdraw below that amount okay. for the minimum operating balance. So what is the report also saying about ATM charges? Okay, so ATM charges, a very, very uh, interesting point, because most of us transact business mm -hmm. with that. So the, the, the costs are divided into issuing costs, and then withdrawing at your ATM, and then maintenance costs. And if you go, go through the report, you realize that Every bank has a cost for issuing. They will charge you, for example, there's a bank that charges 15 Ghana CDs for issuance. But it also depends on the type of card. So maybe prepaid card, debit card, or a credit card. Then you have the charges you pay when you go and withdraw at your bank's own ATM. It's surprising to find that your bank will be charging you for withdrawing at its own ATM. So that's also a cost that uh, you can look at. The report is on the Bank of Ghana's website. And there's one more for maintenance. Some charge on a quarterly basis. 
some charge on a monthly basis. So these are some of the charges from the ATM side. Issuing at the ATM and then maintenance cost of it also. All right, so we put together some graphics uh, depicting uh, the current you know, outlines by the Bank of Ghana. Let's have a look at it. So those were some tidbits from the Bank of Ghana regarding uh, the latest charges for commercial banks. Still in the banking sector, majority of energy bank workers are set to lose their jobs in the coming weeks. This follows the decision by the new owners, First Atlantic Merchant Bank, to restructure the merged entity. But how many workers are going home? Details in this report. We understand that about 100 workers of the merged entity are expected to go home possibly in the coming weeks. Sources say 75% of the workers are coming from Energy Bank, with the remaining coming from First Atlantic Bank. The two institutions merged recently, with First Atlantic Bank having the controlling stake. This was due to Energy Bank's challenge to meet the new minimum capital requirement of 400 million CDs. Now we are learning that the news was communicated to these affected workers last week. Based on what Joy Business has picked up, the workers are being offered a one-month salary multiplied by a number of years served. However, most of them are raising issues with the package being offered. Sources say the letter to officially communicate the package could be coming soon. But according to persons close to management of the First Atlantic Bank, the action was needed because of what they described as duplication of roles as a result of the merger. They also argue that the decision was guided by a review of job functions carried out by an independent consultant and the recommendations adopted. Management of First Atlantic Bank insists the process was fair and staff of both pre-merged entities are going to be affected. They also maintain that they are still in the negotiation stage and things have not firmed up yet. Some of the affected workers have argued about the approach of management of First Atlantic Bank and the fact that they did not really negotiate with them the package being offered. There are also concerns about whether the planned redundancy is going against some gentleman's agreement reached with the Bank of Ghana after the banks merged. And in the latest development, some concerned staff of First Atlantic Bank have rejected severance package. They've sent uh, a release which reads, we the concerned staff of First Atlantic Bank are rejecting the severance package being offered to us by the management of the bank. We also want to put on record that the bank has violated our rights by not giving us at least three months notice ahead of the termination of our appointment and also failing to negotiate our severance package with us. That said, we wish to put on record that the autocratic and Idi Amin-like leadership style of the MD and CEO Mr. Odun Udunfa and his cohorts should cease First Atlantic Bank's working environment is unfriendly, unpalatable, and a hellhole. We will always solidarize with staff, particularly the erstwhile Energy Commercial Bank staff, who were joined to F FAB through the measure, and we urge them not to be intimidated by the Odunfa-led Gorilla management team. Finally, we urge the Bank of Ghana to investigate some fraudulent activities of Mr. Odun Odunfa and Christiana Olawe former MD and CEO of Energy Commercial Bank, particularly on forex transactions and fictitious loans. We shall release full details of these fraudulent activities if the Bank of Ghana fails to investigate. So this is the latest release coming from some staff of the bank and we've been following up with some more updates in subsequent bulletins. But on that note, we draw the curtains down on this afternoon's edition of the market, please. My name is Imano Abwaji. We have a good afternoon.